In the UK, we've just completed the first randomised study comparing roxalitinib to best available therapy. So very similar to the um, studies that have been done in polycythemia vera and myelofibrosis, where we looked at patients who were struggling with their current therapy, which had to be hydroxyurea, and we randomised them to either get roxalitinib or so-called best available therapy, which is physician's discretion of a range of different therapies. And at the EHA meeting earlier this year, we presented data showing the outcome of the study in terms of how good was roxalitinib compared to best available therapy at controlling blood counts. And the short answer is, it's roughly the same. So it's just as effective at controlling the blood counts. The symptoms improved quite a lot as we have come to expect for patients treated with roxalitinib but we saw some increase in toxicity with regard to lowering of haemoglobin, anemia and infections, but nothing that was you know, too bad in making patients stop. At this meeting, what we've done is we've analysed the data in more detail, looked at the occurrence of blood clotting and bleeding and transformation events, which after one year look perhaps slightly more in the patients treated with roxalitinib, but after two years are roughly equivalent. We've also done what many investigators are doing at ASH and which is really the buzz thing at ASH this year is next generation sequencing, looking at molecular genetics, looking at allele burden and molecular responses and correlating them to outcomes. So what we presented at this meeting was a quite an in-depth analysis of that. So what is the top line data? So top line data is that achieving Achievement of molecular response doesn't necessarily correlate with clinical response. Achievement of molecular response did, however, correlate with several aspects of symptom improvement. Symptoms themselves don't particularly correlate with a particular mutation or genetic change, nor do they correlate with the amount of um, that mutation, which is perhaps surprising, but we've never been able to look at that before. We also did an analysis of what impacted upon, were there baseline factors that impacted on the patient's ability to achieve response, to transform or to get toxicity to roxalitinib. So what we found was um, no impact of baseline factors on ability to respond. If you were anemic at the time of starting roxalitinib, you were more likely to remain anemic or get worse. So that's not really rocket science, I guess. But the surprising thing for me was that when we looked at patients who transformed from ET to myelofibrosis, that this only occurred in patients who had a white cell count of less than 10, which is completely counterintuitive to what I expected. Also, um, just underlining the questions that remain about molecular responses, we documented here for the first time that patients with the calreticulin mutation get a molecular response to roxalitinib. We've never documented that before. But unfortunately, one of those three patients then went on to develop transformation. So underlining, you know, yes, we know more about molecular responses, but really understanding the implications for disease is something that's kind of a watch this space, maybe for ASH next year or the year after.